All right, Acts chapter 5 is where we're going to be. If you want to turn there, make your way there. And um, we are going backwards. If you were here last week, we looked at the first part of chapter 6. And, but I want to go back and kind of finish up uh, chapter, chapter 5. So let's start with verse 17, just to keep in mind uh, the apostles are out preaching and teaching, and, and the religious leaders are not happy about it, and so they come and they um, have them arrested, and then we find this interaction of them getting out of prison, and then they actually get drove back to the religious leaders again, and you find the second time that they make this statement of, uh, we must serve God rather than man. So it's uh, a reiteration of what they've already said. So let's start reading in verse 17. He says in verse 17, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the sin of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison, um, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them and wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging Him on a tree. God exalted Him at His right hand as leader and Savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about four hundred, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and came to nothing." After him Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, all and all who were followed him were scattered. So in the present case I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man it will fail. But if it is of God you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. And let's go back to our questions and kind of walk through those tonight. So question one says, according to the end of verse 17, what was the religious leader's real issue and what does that mean? So what was their real issue? If you look at verse 17. Someone said it, I think. Jealousy. Yeah, why was that their real issue? What, what does that mean? Does it mean that they were jealous? They wanted the recognition that being given to Jesus. Yeah. Why was it that they wanted it. 
it's kind of the same reason that we all like to be patted on the back every once in a while, right? I mean, it makes us feel good, and we kind of get to feeling pretty good about ourselves, that people are noticing we're doing good things. And, and, and to be honest, that, that is kind of good to feel every once in a while, right? It's not always the right thing. In this case, what they were saying was, is, you know, we feel like that what you are receiving, because the apostles were receiving attention because they were talking about Christ. Now, the apostles had the right mind frame and they were pointing people to Jesus. They weren't wanting this for themselves, but they were getting attention. And they were getting attention that the religious leaders had been getting in the past. And so they're jealous because they feel like they should be getting that attention and the apostles are getting it instead of them. So this whole thing to them was not about what is true and what is right. It's about who was getting attention. Which is really sad because these are the religious leaders who are supposed to be pointing them and directing them in the ways of God. And yet at this point in time, they're not too concerned about what's actually true. They're more concerned about you're getting something that I should be getting. Does this ever come into play in our lives today? Do we ever feel like somebody's getting something that we should be getting? Do we ever become jealous of something else? If you think about it, we, we probably do. And maybe we don't think about it too often. But sometimes we think about, man, why, why is it that I can't have good health like somebody else has? Why is it that I'm having these issues and these other people are not having those, but yet I am? And we start thinking that we deserve to have that, and yet in reality we forget that Paul tells us that we're really not that great of a person if you read Romans chapter 1 through 3. That our righteousness is as filthy rags, that we really were without hope until Christ came. And because Christ came and because of God's love toward us, we do have hope now. But before that, we really didn't deserve it because we were of sin, fallen nature. And so sometimes we get to thinking that we deserve some things that we really don't. But yet God in His grace has given us things even when we didn't deserve them. But we can't think we deserve that. Have you ever got to a point where you've, we call it sometimes presuming upon grace. It's almost as if we feel we deserve to be forgiven. If we ever get to that point where we think we deserve to be forgiven, we have lost where we truly are in our sin-filled life. The only way we can be forgiven is by the grace of Jesus Christ. And it's not we deserve it. It's that we don't deserve it, but in His goodness He gave it to us, or extends it to us. In question two then, the apostles were arrested. Does following Christ mean that troubles will disappear? No. No, it doesn't. Uh, what does it mean? So following Christ means that troubles don't disappear. What does it mean? That is the exact same answer that was said this morning. Did you talk to somebody this morning? Okay. I'm just kidding. It is the same answer that was given this morning. We're not alone. And, and, that's, and the reason I say that is that's a comforting thought. And it's a thought that we kind of typically have. We're not alone. We don't have to face the world by ourselves. We don't have to face the disappointments of life or, or the illnesses or whatever it may be by ourselves. What else does it mean? We have hope. Absolutely, we have hope. Uh, not just in this life either, but we have hope that the troubles of this life are not the end. Uh, it's just a traveling through time to get to where our eternal is. What else does it mean? We have peace in our trials. Yeah, we have peace in our trials. We have a different outlook on things 
when we're a follower of Christ as opposed to not being a follower of Christ. Now, absolutely, He's with us. Absolutely, we have hope. And that kind of gets into what Jed said, too. That those are kind of tied together. But we have a different outlook ourselves. We realize that the struggle we're going through may not be just for us, but it may be for some people around us that need to see our reaction to the struggle we're dealing with so that they see that we have faith in Christ and they then can develop a faith in Christ because they don't have it right now. But if they see somebody going through a struggle, they may actually just get it because they realize, why are they believing in this? And they're really not having that great of a life right now. And so it's almost a witnessing opportunity at times, too. And sometimes we have to think, and it's good when we do, that our obstacles are not just obstacles, they're opportunities. They're actual opportunities for us to be a witness for Christ, no matter what it is. Sometimes we come in and, and we say, man, it's been one of those days. But we also have to think about, too, that one of those days is also an opportunity to show the rest of the world that one of those days is still great with Christ in our life. Will everyone react favorably when you share or even just live your life faithfully unto God? <clears throat> will, uh, will those who proclaim to be Christians always act favorably when you share or even live your life faithfully unto God? Why is that? I'm sorry? Our flesh gets in the way. Our flesh gets in the way. Yeah, uh, we also have to discern today, too, that there are some who say they are Christian that maybe are really struggling in their walk with Christ. Because if you, and you, I don't have the exact numbers of this, but if you look up the data for the United States of people that proclaim to be Christian, and then you compare that with people that are actually attending church services, and I'm not saying that church attendance is what makes you a Christian, but we do understand that as a Christian you want to be around other believers. And there's a, there's a vast difference between those two numbers. Um, now I understand there are some people that are actually unable to attend. That's a different matter, okay? We're not talking about that. That's a different deal. But um, Sometimes we find even people that, that proclaim to be Christian don't act favorably uh, to the way that Christ instructs us to live our life. Do we see that in the text here? What were the Sadducees? They were the Jewish what? Priests religious leaders, right? They were the people that were supposed to be telling others how to live their life for God. And now you've got the apostles who have been with Christ, the Messiah, who by the way, the Jewish religious leaders said a Messiah was coming at some point in time, but they didn't recognize Christ as Him. They are not approving of what the apostles are doing, even though the apostles are living their life. Do you remember the guy by the name of Paul that wrote over 60% of the New Testament? Original name was Saul. If you remember, he was actually going out trying to arrest people that were Christians because he thought that he was living the life the way God wanted him to live it. He thought he was doing what was right. We know he wasn't, but he thought he was. And so sometimes there's people that think they're doing right, and in I'm going to say, I'm going to use ignorance in the not in a, just, they're ignorant of what, and I don't mean that bad, they just don't know that they're living it wrong, okay? And sometimes we have that today. Sometimes we let our flesh get in the way or our stubbornness get in the way. Um, C. 
several years ago now, I think Matthew was 12, 12 or 13, one. And Don Matchett, some of you may remember him, he was a state missions director for a long time. And Don Matchett took a, a group of youth from the state to Salt Lake City. And at that time, Scott Warren was the missionary to Salt Lake City. If you know anything about Salt Lake City, it's Mormon area, right? Heavily Mormon area. And so he took them out there, and um, Scott was the only free will, there was one other free will Baptist couple in uh, Utah. But there was also some missionaries from Southern Baptists, that time Methodist, and there was another denomination too, I don't remember which one it was, but some of the ev evangelical denominations. And uh, so Scott was taking all these teenagers around, he was showing them what they do, and, and many of the interactions that they were having was these multiple denominations being together, doing the, the activity or the event together. And so, um, I don't know if it was Don or Scott, but one of them, and Matthew came back telling us this, one of them said, if we did not stick together, then we would become so discouraged that we would quit. And it really stuck with me, because sometimes we get so denominational, and I understand that, that we understand things the way we understand them. I get that. But if there's another denomination that's fully believing in the Bible and trusting Christ and knows that that's the way of salvation, why can't we work together? Because reality is, whether you're Free Will Baptist, Southern Baptist Church, Christ, whatever you are, you're not the only ones that's going to be in Christ. In heaven, sorry. <laughs> in Christ too, but, but in heaven. And so, it's actually a, a beautiful thing to see different churches, denominations working together. There really should be more of it, but sometimes we let our thoughts and our ideas prevent us from actually accomplishing something greater than what we do individually. Any questions or thoughts down through there? Okay, what group of religious leaders had the apostles arrested? What was their not title or name? We've said it already. Sadducees, right? Why was it interesting that angels are the ones that open the prison doors for the apostles to get out? What is it that the Sadducees did not believe in? <coughs> two things, maybe more than that, but at least two that are pretty significant. The resurrection's one of them, and what's the other one? They didn't believe in angels. <laughs> Do you ever wonder if God has a sense of humor? Like you, I said this at nursing home today, and it it. It didn't, uh, they didn't get it, but, um, which is my fault. The duckbill platypus. You ever seen one? Like, God has a sense of humor in some of these things. You got to believe that. Like, why, why does, why, the way that it is? I, I don't know. There's other things in creation too, right? That you just wonder why, why are they that way? And, and so, look at what God does here. You've got a group of people that don't believe in angels. They arrest the apostles that are trying to share Christ. And God says, ah, I'm going to send an angel to go unlock the door. So when the religious leaders bring Peter and the apostles back in front of them and say, how do you get out? What's their answer? Angel let me out. No, really tell me how did you get out? Angel let me out. I mean, God works in ways that we don't understand sometimes. And I don't know if the, like if the apostles really grasped that, you know, this was angels let me out, so now I'm going to stand in front of the Sadducees who don't believe in angels, and I'm going to get to tell them that angels let me out. I don't know if they grasped that or not, but I think it's interesting that we see that here, that God worked in that way. Well, God always opened prison doors in our lives. No, He doesn't always do that. We don't always understand why, but we do know that He does have a reason for that. Here we find that He did. We also realize that later on all the apostles were martyred. Uh, Paul, 
He appealed unto Rome, got to share the gospel in Rome, but Paul was actually put to death for his faith. So um, God will not always open prison doors. We also say yes on that because it's his perfect plan. Yeah, yeah, I guess it depends on which perspective. Yeah, you're right. Because if from our perspective he doesn't open the door, from his it's a different door. But yeah, good point. Question four, why was it important that the Scripture tells us that the apostles entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach? So what did the angels tell them to do? Go, go preach, right? I mean, summarize, go preach. Go back to the temple and preach. Why is it important that text tells us, Scripture tells us that they done this at daybreak? First thing they did. Absolutely. Like, we don't read that, okay, after they ate breakfast, they went to the temple and they began. Or after they stopped at Shadrach's and got coffee, then they went to the temple and began. It says they went at daybreak, the time that some activity would first start happening at the temple, they were there. The angels told them, you go do this. They find an or they have an urgency about being obedient to what the angels told them to do. God told them to do because ultimately we know it came from God. They had an urgency to do this. Do we always have urgencies to do what God instructs us to do? Y'all have heard me use this example before. I stand in the Walmart checkout line. I know I need to say something to the person that's. Checking me out. I, I, person that's scanning the groceries. <clears throat> that did not come out right. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm about losing the train of thought. I know I need to say something to this person, and, and I don't. And then I get out the door, and I'm you, I. I realize I missed the opportunity. I didn't do it. They had an urgency to do what God told them to do. There was no holding back in this. Now keep in mind, they had just been arrested. Of course, they had also had angels come open the door for them and say, hey, go do what you were just doing. So it's kind of encouraging too. But they had no hesitancy because they also knew that they've already been told, don't go do this. They also know that in Jewish custom, they've already been warned. So the next step is beating or death. Because now they're going to be drugged back again, they assume they'll be drugged back again. But they had no hesitancy, and they went as early as they could to go do this. What do you think would happen if we did exactly what God told us to do in an urgent manner, no matter where it was and no matter what it was? I think it is important that Scripture tells us that they done it at daybreak. Because I think it shows that they were either, number one, so intent on being obedient, they were going to do it as quick as they could do it. Or number two, they were so excited to share the gospel of Christ because it had changed their life, and they had seen the changes it made in other people's lives, that they could not hold back, and they wanted as many people changed as they could see changed. Not them doing it, but God doing it. They were just a messenger for it to happen. One of those two things, and maybe both of them, was what was motivating them to do it. Which then brings us to the question of, have we lost how much change Christ has brought to our life? Because if we really grasp how much God has changed us through Christ, don't we want other people to experience that same thing? Which then means we would have an urgency to talk to them somehow about Christ, and not just to invite them to church. Now, I'm not saying don't invite them. I'm saying that we do more than just invite them. There was a, um, we had state meeting, we had people speaking about discipleship, and one of the phrases that a guy brought up that's in the Bible, and you see it repetitively over and over, is this phrase, come and see. When Jesus calls some of His apostles, disciples, when He calls them, He tells them, come and see. One of them asks Him, where are you staying? And He says, come and see. 
invites them into the place that he was going to stay that night. Why? Because he wanted them to see his life. Come and see. One of the individuals that becomes an apostle goes to his brother and he says, hey, I need you to come and see. We think we found the one. And then you flash ahead and you have Christ interacting with the Samaritan woman at the well. And he talks to her and he says, you know, the husband that you're with is not even your husband at this point. Go and send no more. And she goes back down into the village and what does she do? Hey guys, y'all need to come and see this guy that's just told me everything about my life. In other words, there's this invitation, but there's also this understanding of, I want to tell you about the one that I want you to come and see. Sometimes our invitation to church is, hey, why don't you come to church with me? It starts at 10 o'clock, 10.30. You can come at 10, it'll be fine. But you give them the start time and you say, you know, just come to church with me. Why don't we say, hey, why don't you come and see what's going on at our church? Because there's lives that are being changed there, and it's not by anything we're doing. It's what Christ is doing, and we want you to come and see it. It's an invitation to church, but it's also an invitation to what Christ is doing in the life. And it opens the avenue for them to say, well, what's going on? You just invited me to see something. What is it you want me to see there? I want you to see people that are changing their life. But it's not them changing it, it's Christ changing it. They're just being willing. And then they're willing to actually go to the temple as soon as the temple is open at daybreak and continue to talk about Christ. All right, would you agree with the statement by William Ward? Every great person has learned how to obey, whom to obey, and when to obey. What do you think? Every great person has learned how to obey, whom to obey, and when to obey. Yeah, this is where we got stuck this morning. How do you find a great person? It helps to know who William Ward is. Anyone know who he is? He was a missionary. He was. Baptist missionary, very faithful man. So when he speaks in terms of, of every great person, we're going to assume he's talking about great person in the eyes of God, not the eyes of mankind. Because the world would look and say, man, he was a great person. He may be terrible morals, but had done something you know, invented the coffee machine or something. I don't know. <clears throat> um, yeah. No, he's not. But anyway, um, great person. Great person as identified by God would be a follower of God's Christ, follower of Christ. Someone that is trying to emulate what they saw in Christ so that other people would see Christ through their life. Great person. So if we identify the great person as that individual, is the statement right? Yes. They've learned how to obey, whom to obey, and when to obey. And that would be summed up with following Christ. Right. Verses 25 through 26, why did they not arrest or use force to get the apostles the second, well, third time now that they bring them in? But second time that's what we read. Why did they not use force? Yeah, they were afraid of the people, afraid of the crowd. So they, they didn't do what they wanted to do because they were afraid of the crowd, and they were afraid that the crowd would actually rebel against them. And there would be an uprising that would be caused. And what were the Jews always fearful of, considering that they were under Roman rule? Yeah, because the Romans had said, all right, y'all can have your own little religion as long as it stays under control. But if there's a threat of an uprising that may threaten Rome, then we're going to shut you down. Now, those are all paraphrased words, but that's their mentality with this. So, the Jewish religious leaders, Sadducees here, and the people that actually went to arrest them said, hey, if we arrest them by force, 
there's a chance that people are going to rebel because there's a lot of people that's bought into this Christ following thing. So we can't arrest them by force. Now what we see is the apostles are willing to go along because they could have like dug their heels in and said, well, we're not going, you're going to have to take us by force. We don't find the apostles doing that. Which is kind of interesting. So they go, somewhat willingly. But they were afraid of this uprising. And so they caved kind of to the people around them. Do we ever cave to what is around us? We ever become afraid of the people around us, and so we, we change our actions because we're fearful of those people? We find that they did that here, which doesn't show that they're very firm in their beliefs. It shows that they're trying to people please. Did the apostles ever people please? No. No, not after Christ ascends. Prior to that, while they were still learners, learning, they may have. But they didn't now. And any time we find from this point forward, they don't people please, but they do what they know God wants them to do. Question 7, what was Peter and the apostles' answer in verse 29? We must obey God rather than men. We kind of had a little bit of this discussion a few weeks ago, right? Um, I don't know if you had some time to think on it anymore. What is, you know, obeying God rather than man? Uh, you read Romans chapter 13. We're actually instructed to obey the laws of the land unless the laws of the land go against God. Then we have to think through, well, you know, at what point does it go against God? Um, flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2, if you would, because this is the other reference we have in the New Testament. Keep in mind, Romans chapter 13 was written by who? Romans was written by Paul. Yeah, so Paul wrote Romans. Paul is saying, um, you need to obey the governmental leaders that's been placed over you. 1 Peter Chapter 2, starting in verse 13. Now, who is Peter written by? Peter. Peter, right. Peter. So, Paul says it in Romans 13. Peter in Romans, or uh, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 says in verse 13, Be subject, I want you to notice the next few words, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Who was the emperor at this point in time? Peter's life. Any ideas? It starts with an N. Four letter word, we can do this like. Nero. Yeah. yeah. Nero. Nero. Nemo? <laughs> Nemo was not the Roman emperor. Yeah. <laughs> Nero was, though. What do we know about Nero? He was not a fish. He was not a fish. I'm going to tell you one thing about Nero, and it'll tell you everything that you need to know. Nero had a garden. He wanted his garden to be lit at night. So you know how he lit it? He impaled those who were Christians and set them on fire and put them in the garden so that he would have light to see his garden at night. That's Nero. And Peter is saying, to do what to the emperor? That's kind of tough, isn't it? 
And not only did Peter say it, you flip over to Romans chapter 13, and Paul says it. Pretty tough words to swallow in this day and time, that day and time, and our day and time maybe as well. Certain situations anyway. So Peter and, and, and the apostles' answer here is we must obey God rather than men. How do we know when we're obeying God rather than man? How do we know when those two things conflict? Well, we have it easier because we can double-check it with the Bible. We, so we have the Bible as a, as a source to do that. Do we always go to the Bible and say, okay, this is conflicting with God, so therefore I'm not going to obey this? Or do we say, you know, I feel like that that is not what God would want me to do. So I'm not going to obey it. And do you see the difference in the two? I'm going to give you an example. I know it's not a popular one. Go back to the year 2020. 2019, 2020. And we were all kind of instructed to wear something that we didn't want to wear, right? And it wasn't a t-shirt. It was a mask. We didn't really want to do that. But we were told to. Did that prevent us from serving God? Did we sometimes act as though it prevented us from serving God? Now, Please understand, I didn't want to wear a mask either, at all. But that wasn't a situation where, so we disobey government so that we can obey God. That, that wasn't one of those, because you can't go to the Bible and find that anywhere. Now this didn't happen in the state of Arkansas. Uh, there was some areas, I think California maybe it happened, but um, during that time, what if they would have said, okay, all of the churches need to close. You can't meet anymore for a period of time. They did not say that, by the way, in Arkansas. But what if they would have? <laughs> Y'all looking at something up there? Are they really? <laughs> it made me look, yeah. Um, do I? We should have found a way to that. Yeah, so, so this gets back to the question then. This is a building we choose to assemble here, and it's a great thing to do, right? Hopefully you all find benefit in assembling together as people in the building here. Do we have to assemble together in a building here in order to follow God? No. Is it beneficial? Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't have to, and here's an example of it. You go to China, and you get into the underground church, they don't have a church building. They have homes that they meet in secretly, because if they're found out, they will be arrested. By the year 2027, I think it was 27, 27, 28, one of, the, one of those two. It was before 2030. It is thought that there will be more Christians in the underground church in China than there will be Americans in the United States. And they don't have, now there are some church buildings in China, so don't, don't walk out of here saying, you know, there's no church, but there are some church buildings. They have to register with the government if they have a church building, and they can only talk about the things that the government will let them talk about. What I'm talking about is the underground church, the church that's not registered with the government, the church that says we're going to follow Christ in the way Christ wants us to go. They have said, okay, the emperor is now preventing us from serving Christ in the way we should, so we're going to have this, they didn't term it underground church, we've termed it that, but, but they said we're going to meet together and we're going to serve God in the way that we can, but they don't have a church building to do it. But in some ways, we had probably some conversations that said, you know, government's not going to keep me from meeting at church because they're infringing upon me being able to serve God. That's not really true. Because there's other areas of the world where they are serving God and they don't have a church building. Is it beneficial and do we want to meet together? Absolutely we want to meet together. I love to see every one of your smiling faces every time you're here. And I want you to be here. 
It's great when we assemble together. So I'm not saying that that's not important and that we don't want to do that. I'm just saying that we have to determine what goes against God when we get into these kind of decisions. Because sometimes we want to throw things out there that we think go against God, and they don't really go against God. And so we're laying this groundwork of, we're going to use this statement that the apostles make to justify something we don't want to do, or we do want to do, whichever way that is. And we've got to be very careful about this. Because if we're going to use this statement of, we must obey God rather than man, we better make sure that we're obeying God when we do that. And not what we want to do. Because that is two different things. And sometimes we, we even use this and say, well, if we don't do this now, then in six months, here's what the government will do. How many times did God tell you to worry about six months from now? Yeah, he never told you to worry about six months from now, except eternity, it's salvation of your soul. And he talks about it persevering till the end, obviously, it's that. But he never told you to worry about what happened day to day, six months from now. He said, trouble enough is today. Any questions or comments about that before we go to question eight? Who does Peter say will receive forgiveness of sins in verse 31? God exalted him his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Who does he say he's going to receive if they repent? Who's going to receive forgiveness of sins? Israel. Why is that interesting at this point? Because we hope it's not just Israel, right? <laughs> you do realize what that means. Because that would be like Jewish nation. We hope it's not just them. We hope they do, but not just them. But that's what Peter says here. Now, number one, he's talking to a Jewish audience at this point in time. So, you have that. But secondly, what do we know about Peter? Did Peter have everything exactly right and understand everything he needed to understand at this point in his walk with Christ? They struggled with the Gentiles, especially you know, him and Paul kind of put heads a little bit They did. Him and Paul had this, it was actually a, kind of a conflict that they had within the church because Paul was considered an apostle to the Gentiles and Peter was an apostle to the Jews and and so when Paul gets on his mission field and he starts coming back and talking about how the Gentiles have received the gospel, Peter's like, hmm, well, they probably need to do these things. And what Peter was kind of stuck on was they almost need to become Jew and then they can become saved by Christ. So Peter makes a statement here, and I think it's really interesting that he makes this in the way that he does, because it shows that Peter doesn't know everything right now nor did he know everything at any point. But what we find is that Peter continued to learn. And God showed Peter, and you'll see this in a few chapters over, God revealed to Peter that Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, which was the sign of them being accepted by God. And so Peter saw that, and so he had to change his way of thinking. But at this point he's talking about, by the statement, that it was for Israel to receive forgiveness when they repented. Question 9, was Gamaliel an ally of the apostles? Not really, except for this one instant. <laughs> and it wasn't really an ally, he was just actually speaking kind of some wisdom at this point in time. When he used the phrase, fighting against God, did this change the atmosphere in the room? So, so his statement um, find it. Um, where's that? I'm missing it right now. 39. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Do you think that changed the atmosphere in the room? When th Now th keep in mind, this is a guy that is a Jewish trainer. 
He's very well respected in the Jewish community. He was actually the guy that trained Paul. Paul studied under him. Uh, so he's very well respected. So the Sadducees, the religious people at this point in time, are hearing this guy that has trained many. And he's saying, you might even be found to be against God. You think that changed the atmosphere in the room? Probably did to some degree. Um, what was Gamaliel, what do you think possibly was Gamaliel's motive for giving this advice? Was it because he cared for the apostles? It may have been curious. But may have been curious. Also, still probably in the back of his mind trying to prevent any sort of uprising amongst the people. Conflict. Yeah, this uprising thing was a fear of theirs because if Rome come in, and keep in mind now we're um, year wise we're probably this is a guess so don't we're probably somewhere around forty forty five somewhere in there possibly and probably before that probably around forty I'll say that probably no later than forty. Do you remember what happened thirty years into the future? Rome did. Year 70? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, they actually destroyed Jerusalem, year 70, um, because they were fearful that Jewish people was creating an uprising. And so they went in and destroyed Jerusalem um, in a terrible way. If you ever get a chance to read about that, if you want to know how cruel the Roman Empire could have been, Go read about how they destroyed Jerusalem. It was it was bad, but um, at this point they were probably still fearful of the Romans that they would come in and do that. And so they were trying to keep peace. And so Gamaliel sees this as an opportunity to try and keep peace. At this point, now it was some wise words, which tells us God was probably working in his life, giving him this. Question 10 then, from verse 41, what was the reaction of the apostles after they left the council? They were joyful. They were joyful. It says they rejoiced, right? Um, what were they rejoicing at? Christ's name. Christ's name, okay. They were beaten. Rejoiced that they were beating, been, had been beaten, suffered in his name. Suffered in his name. Okay. Look at it and read it with me again. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Were they rejoicing that they had been beaten? I don't know about you, but there's never been a time that I was really happy about getting beaten in some way. And I don't think they were happy about getting beaten necessarily. So what was it that they were so happy about? Was it that they were worthy? But they were thought of being worthy. Yeah. Someone looked at them, now we know who it was, this this Sadducee bunch of people, they looked at these apostles and they said, they look like Christ and we do not want that to continue to happen. So we want to end it. But they done it because they looked like Christ. They were rejoicing that someone thought that they looked like Christ. That's the ultimate of it. Now they did get beaten and this, this whole counted worthy thing, but someone counted them in their mind, they were counted worthy to look like Christ. Should we, we've talked about this kind of before, should we have to identify ourselves as a Christian? Not really, because people should see it in our life, right? Actually, it should be other people that identify us as a Christian. If we want to identify ourselves as anything, we should actually say that we're a disciple of Christ. We're a learner about Christ. The apostles were not boasting about themselves. They were boasting that someone saw Christ in them. 
which is really where we should be today. We should be thrilled when someone sees Christ in us, even if they reject Christ. Because keep in mind, these people that had just beaten them, they had rejected, whether you want to call it that or not, they had rejected Christ at this point in time. They may have accepted Him later, but at this point they had rejected Him. They weren't rejoicing that they had rejected Him. They were rejoicing that they saw Christ in them. That something about their life had changed to where other people were seeing. When we talk about people will see the light of Christ in us, that we'll be a light to the community, that's what they had just been. And they were rejoicing that someone else had identified that in them. Question 11 then, what are the actions that are recorded in verse 42 that the apostles continued to do? And how often were they doing them? Do you think they had to be talked into doing these things? So what were they doing in verse 42? Teaching and preaching. How often were they doing them? Daily. Daily. Do you think they had to be talked into doing these things? No, that's why I believe that. I mean, if you look back to the first verse, it said, as soon as they were out of the prison, they went and preached. You know, at daybreak, they were already at the temple preaching. Yeah. So, I mean, if they did it then, nothing's changed. That's bad. What kept them? What do you think kept them motivated to do it? Because it says they they done it daily. So this was like an ongoing thing. We don't, we're not told like how many days in a row they did, but we're going to assume that this went on for a long period of time. What do you think kept them motivated to do this? Love for Christ absolutely played into it. What else? I'm sorry? Maybe each other. Maybe each other. So the, the people around them encouraging them to, to do it. What else? Seeing other people come to Christ. Seeing other people come to Christ. Yeah. How encouraged are you when you see someone else come to Christ? How encouraged should you be when you see someone else come to Christ? Should be joyful and happy, right? And it should motivate us to say, man, Christ made this difference in their life. Why don't we want to share this with someone else? Because that difference could be made in their life too. You got to imagine the apostles have just witnessed two different occasions, thousands of people accepting Christ. And they've got this crowd of people that's gathered around them, and they're, they're interested in hearing. They've went into the temple, and now people can't arrest them because they're fearful of the crowd that's listening to them because they're talking about Christ. And they know that Christ will change their lives because He changed theirs. They were excited to continue to share because they saw the change in people. This is almost like kind of one of those... Um, what do you call them when they continuous circles? That's not the right term. Huh? Concentric, circle. Concentric circle, whatever it is. The ones with the arrows that just keep going around and around. Y'all know what I'm talking about, please tell me that. Because I don't want to have to keep trying to explain it. <laughs> All right, so do what? Anyway, I don't know what they said. Anyway, um, it's almost one of these, it just kind of keeps going. When, when people get excited about the changes that they see in people's lives, then it builds excitement. And then they decide, hey, we have something that someone else needs, and it will change their life, so let's keep telling them about it. It's kind of like this phrase back to what we said, come and see, because we just want you to see what's happening. Because if you see what's happening, there's a great chance it's going to change your life. And when that happens, and people start getting excited about lives being changed, then they don't want it to stop. They want to keep seeing lives changed. And so it keeps going and keeps going. you got to imagine, yes, they were excited because they had saw Christ. They had been released from prison by an angel. They had been beaten because someone had saw Christ in them. But they are also seeing lives changed. If they would have quit seeing lives changed, would they have kept doing this? I think they would have. It would have been probably more difficult. But it would have been more difficult. You can't walk with Christ for three years and not keep doing it. I don't think. And you could say, well, Judas did. 
right? But these guys actually had a true heart change. Judas never did. These guys had a true heart change three years with Christ, and now they've seen what He's done afterwards. I don't think they would have quit even if they would have stopped seeing souls saved, but they didn't stop seeing souls saved. If they would have stopped seeing souls saved, then Gamaliel would have been right. But we're now 2,000 years from when Gamaliel said, if this is of man, it'll die. If it's of God, you won't be able to stop it. For 2,000 years it's kept going. It's not stopped. It becomes... Um, in what environment do we actually see Christianity flourish? Is it in an environment where they're absolutely free to, we're absolutely free to do whatever we want to do? Is that where we see Christianity flourish? Where do we see it flourish? What did I just tell you about China? Yeah. We actually see Christianity flourish when it's under persecution. You've seen it in China right now. Africa, there's a ton of believers in Africa. It's a shame that in a country where we have freedom to do it that we take it for granted. And we don't have excitement about someone changing their life. Um, I'm going to end uh, with a story, I think. Yeah, um, and this is, is in no way, well, let me just tell you the story. Um, so I was on the phone last night with Michael. Most of you know our youngest son, Michael. Um, when he went to college, he started out to be an attorney, actually, because he loved to argue, so it fit him well. <laughs> and then uh, he came to me one day, I think it was his first semester, maybe his second one, and he said, Dad, I think I want to change my major to being a, a school teacher. And I said, well, why? And uh, he said, well, I've kind of realized that the school system needs some good Christian teachers in it. He said, not that there's not some, but, but needs Christian teachers in it. I mean, perpetually needs that. So, like, how do you argue with that, right? You say, oh, no, it doesn't need that. You continue to be a lawyer because you like to argue. So you can't really argue with that. So he changed his major, um, became a history teacher, teaches this year, um, He's taught U.S. history since whatever the year is, but it took in uh, a few of the years prior to the Civil War, so maybe 1850 or something. I don't know what it was. And whatever class he was teaching, he will not have these kids again before they graduate. So it's the last time he'll see them in a classroom setting. And so I was on the phone with him last night. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm trying to write out, because today was his last day with students. And he said, I'm trying to write out what I want to say to them. It was my last day. I said, okay, well, what's that? And he said, well, he said, this may be the opportunity, I, the last opportunity I ever have to invest in her life. And I want it to be something meaningful. Um, and I said, well, do you remember why you told me you changed your major? And he said, yeah, that's why I'm doing this. I said, okay. I said, well, what, what do you want to write about then? And he said, well, I don't really know. He said, but I want them to know what God has done in my life. And I said, well, are you worried about getting in trouble because you're in a public school? And he said, no, not really. Um, and I said, well, you know, if you remember why you changed your major, he said, yeah, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't realized what God wanted me to do. So I haven't talked to him this afternoon, but um, he was today going to actually share with his students, not necessarily his testimony, but he was going to tell them about God. Not in a way that told them this is what you need to do, but almost in a come and see kind of thing. Um, as I thought about that today, it's really convicting to me. 
Because I didn't do that at the age of 21. And I didn't do that at the age of 30. Um, and I probably hadn't done it as well as I should even. And so it got me to thinking, what if, because I don't know if you all remember last week, I said, I don't know if we'll go back and finish chapter 5 or not, but we may move on in chapter 6. And then I went back and thought about what chapter 5 was over, and it's all about them being faithful to share and continue, even though they were being persecuted, or the risk of being persecuted, the risk of losing their life, and yet they still were faithful to do it. So I thought, what if that, in every job that we have, what if our determination was to make sure that the people we interact with know the change that God has made in our life? And would that make the community look different? Because that is what we're really about, is getting the community to see Christ so that there's a difference in their life. So I don't know what that um, means to you today, um, but I, I trust that you will have time with God about what that means in your own life today. Because I'm not saying that you're not doing this. I'm, that's not what I'm up here saying. I'm just saying we see what the apostles did. We see that they were dedicated. Um, and maybe we need to rededicate ourselves to the seriousness of sharing the gospel with other people. Not necessarily just coming out and saying, do you know Christ? But maybe it is we need to say, do you know Christ? Maybe we just need to say, come and see what's going on. Because Christ is changing lives. Pray with me if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and, and uh, we're thankful for your grace. Uh, I'm thankful for your grace and I know those gathered here today are too. But I'm thankful because there's times that I've not done what you wanted me to do. Um, and I wish that I was better about that. So I, I ask for your conviction in those times. And I pray that I would listen, and I pray that we all would listen in the way that you would desire us to on a daily basis. That we would learn from the example of the apostles here, and that we would be faithful to, to have the excitement to preach and teach as we go daily. And Lord, ultimately, just be excited when someone sees Christ through just the way we've lived our life. So Lord, I pray that for each of us here. I ask you, Lord, that you would help us as we make decisions as, as a church, but even as churches in the community. I pray that you help us to, to reach those who are lost around us and to have a desire to reach those who are lost around us. I thank you for your son, for what he did on the cross, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.